it's a privilege uh, being here and uh, i honestly didn't expect such a huge audience uh, thank you it's such a it's such an exciting feeling actually to be talking to a class uh, to a management class i'll just uh, have created a few slides to aid our discussion today i'll just bring them on first and then we can start can everybody see the slides uh, and hear me and see me okay i'm i'm hoping that i'm not seeing any uh, yes, yes. Go ahead. okay all right great so uh, i just thought i'll start with a bit of an introduction uh, meenakshi's done a good job and uh, thank you for that video very flattering video of uh, me uh, but i thought i'll just uh, tell you very quickly i am a vice president at invest india my job is to talk to american and european investors and uh, one of the reasons why i'm bringing this here is because uh, we've got a very unique perspective over the last 3 months of what companies are thinking how they are planning to react um, and some of their thoughts fears concerns and what uh, probably are the opportunities for the future before i joined invest india i was a banker i was with uh, state bank of india capital markets uh, for a long time and before that uh, i was part of the last batch of recruits at lehman brothers uh, i don't know if any uh, any of you remember I, i'm not sure if the students remember but about yeah, 12 yeah. years ago we had a major global financial crisis and one of the casualties of that crisis was lehman brothers i'll I, again there's a point to why i'm bringing this up right now but uh, uh just thought i'll put that here for now and again just to give you a bit about my education i'm an engineer uh, a computer engineer from delhi and i did my mba from i am bangalore just before i became a banker so this is the main question today what do we do after covid 19 i think we've suffered and we've waited and uh, i think some of us are continue to waiting uh, continue to wait um so now the question is what do we do now because there's a lot of disruption but before we get there um uh, i i would like to discuss the this question a bit you know when will covid-19 get over and uh, is there a point where it will get over so from my discussions with a number of companies across the world uh all of them are preparing for this to be the new reality nobody is saying that there is a definite point of time where covid-19 will actually get over where we'll be actually rid of the virus and we can go back to normal i think there is a certain amount of disruption that has become permanent uh, at least that's what the companies are saying you know so when i was a uh, trader when i was a trader at lehman and at sbi one of the things that you learn very quickly is that it's not what you think is right you may think that uh, a particular equity stock price is right you've done the valuation you study the balance sheet and you've got a particular price but if you enter the market saying that you know my price is right and i will buy when the price is low uh, lower than the right price and sell when the price is lower than the right uh, higher than the right price you will most often than not just lose money because it's not it's not what you think is right it's what you think other people think is right and it's a market consensus that you need to react to not what you think is right so all of us may believe or may understand that you know we have taken all the precautions and uh, covid-19 will have a finite lifetime and we'll get a vaccine at some point of time the lockdowns will ease but that's not what everybody else is thinking the world around is fearing another reprisal another pandemic another uh, virus coming like covid-19 could be deadlier than before could be not as deadly as before but again you know it's going to lead to major disruptions so people are now going to think in a very very different way i think that's one of the key learnings of this crisis all the old paradigms are being revisited none of the old assumptions are valid anymore in fact they have to be reexamined and examined and you know the basic things of life have to be now checked uh something for example as uh, do we need 
uh, offices anymore. You know, a usual practice for a lot of companies now will be to start building, it would have been to uh, procure land, start building and buy machinery, employ people. Do we need all of that anymore? I think the more successful companies, the more adept companies are thinking in that direction. They're going back to basics, they're going back to fundamentals. So in a, in a, in a way, COVID-19 probably will never get over. You know, I think, and we'll have to live with it. And I think we'll have to react and work accordingly. I'll just bring this picture up. I used to work in this building a long time back. Uh, Lehman Brothers, this was the headquarters. And, uh, you know, at that point of time when, and even in the weeks to the bankruptcy, it happened in September 20, 2008. Uh, you know, you can't forget see such events because you're sitting in the office building and you can see the market crashing around you. So it's one of those memories that uh, will always stay with you. And, you know, at that point of time, you kind of think the world has come down, you know, the world has uh, gotten over and uh, there are no job prospects, economy has collapsed, nobody is hiring. And, uh, you know, but after a point of time, the world got back into its gear and people started working, people started uh, going back to jobs and, and, and sorry, sorry, started hiring. Um, banks started doing well. I think in the two years after Lehman Brothers collapsed, I think that was the most successful years for a number of American banks. But you know, what I'm trying to say is that the global financial crisis, which was probably one of the largest disruptions uh, to economies globally, had a definite end. You can probably say that, you know, there is an end and there was a, there was a start to another crisis or start toward another cycle. I don't think COVID-19 is like that. And I think this is a, a unique crisis for all of us to stop and think and understand what needs to be done. So, you know, I just thought I'll, I'll start with an interactive exercise. Uh, I'm not sure whether we have a chat. Yeah, we have a chat function over here. I just got a message saying that we're not able to see the screen sharing. I hope everybody's able to see the screen share now. Yes, we will. We can okay, see. fine, fine. Okay. So I just thought I'll do a uh, class exercise for everyone. So what do you think are going to be the challenges post COVID? Uh, you know, when we start going back to work and when we have the lockdown lifted up, what do you think? And if any, everyone can just quickly pen down on the group chat, I'll start putting it up on the slide. Anybody? So obviously you're going to see the economy go down. You're going to see jobs going down, but what else? Any, anything else that uh, you are seeing from your end? This is a question to the audience where yes, you expected to probably respond um, by putting up on the chat. Yeah. What were your yes, thoughts? That's about? right. Yeah. Jobs. So I just got my first response. So jobs. I'll just get. So jobs or in employment. Okay. What else? Okay, decline in the economy. Okay, something very interesting. Ma change of manufacturing hub from China to other countries. That's a very interesting point. I'll talk about that as well. Okay, okay. Supply, demand, luxury items. That's an interesting one. Okay. Large scale selling in stock markets. I'm not seeing that. I, I don't know if you see that there's a lot of uh, company, uh, the, the stock markets are at the highest now. So I'm not sure if that's true. Reduction in purchasing power of the common people. Again, uh, not so sure because inflation will sort of come down. Um, but yeah, okay. Make in India will lead the way. Reduction in salaries, deduction in salaries is good. Okay. Travel, yeah. 
close interaction with colleagues okay good one managing systemic challenges okay i'm not really sure what that means but okay trade barriers trade barriers are going to be a challenge anyway okay i think we are going we're going into the same points that i mentioned again so i have made a slide as well and let me see if i can just share that so one of the first things that we saw was definitely an economy slowdown we had to shut down every aspect of the economy every aspect of life people just stopped going to offices so the first thing was you know fuel prices crashed i don't know if you remember last 2 3 weeks uh, oil price prices reached a negative price people wanted to give money to other people to take away oil because there was they were running out of storage prices um then you had obviously revenue loss people were not buying uh, enough stuff um, they were not going to shops malls had shut down a lot of services like uh, uh, barber services tailoring services a lot of the msmes who needed that physical customers coming through suddenly shut down all your street vendors uh, suddenly shut down so demand was a big disruption but apart from that supply chain became a disruption a big disruption as well so com companies which were allowed to operate so you had your pharmaceutical companies medical devices companies they were all allowed to operate during this lockdown but uh, they were dependent on other things you know so for a very simple example that happened was uh, truck drivers that needed to go from one place to another they were not allowed to leave their homes and if they left their homes they were not able to reach their trucks if they reach their trucks if they got on the highway they were not able to find food to eat and you know these truck drivers they're on the road for 2 3 days where do they stay where do they eat so truck drivers just stopped coming even if they were allowed so there was a massive supply chain disruption not just in india but globally one factory that produced the smallest of component let's say a bolt that goes into a pharma medical device now suddenly you can't just ship that out because that factory is not operating and you don't have that component uh, so the entire supply chain got disrupted and inventories ran down companies nowadays don't operate on large inventories they have very lean inventories so they run out of inventory within weeks or months um, or sometimes in days in, in some of the auto companies it's by the hour i don't know if you have heard heard of the just in time uh, philosophy but literally by the hour uh, some of these companies uh, are are expecting parts to come in and if you disrupt that supply chain for almost an hour or a day it's a, it's a disaster for them and as one of you mentioned as you had the economy slow down as the demand went down supply chains got disrupted people were not sure what to do suddenly the lowest strata of economy the laborers the migrants they were out of jobs um over the last two months a lot of offices discovered that they could do much more with much less so they decided to let go of their third party contractors vendors suppliers housekeeping staff there's a number of people who are still looking for jobs in the economy and and this is a global phenomenon it's not just india reverse migration this is something that is unique to india though uh, we have one of the largest diaspora in the world you know, who is still which is still very very connected very closely linked to the motherland and as soon as they lost their jobs you would see them coming back in fact the state of kerala in the last two months uh, last six months has received more than half a million people coming in after losing their jobs uh, from the gulf from europe from us and all of them are coming to a state or to a country where anyway there is an employment and economic crisis so it's just doubling the problem the burden on the government government balance sheet was anyway always a bit stressed uh, we were in on the verge of announcing a number of incentive plans a number of uh, fiscal measures 
more taxes. We were still re uh, recalibrating or coming back from the GST, and we were just we had just achieved a steady state, and suddenly you have this economy slow down, and uh, so there's a sudden drop in tax revenues. If you just analyze the data that has come in in the last few months, you would see that uh, revenues have dropped severely. Health facilities stressed out, and this is a very direct one. You, you must already know this, and this is one of the main reasons for the lockdown. COVID-19, once it reaches a particular stage, requires intensive care. It requires an ICU facility, but it's not the only disease or uh, condition that requires ICU facility. And if you have a COVID-19 patient in an ICU, then no other patient can access that ICU. So cancer patients or people who have to go critical, undergo critical surgery for whatever reason, heart patients, or any other patient suddenly were just excluded from ICUs. Not just ICUs, outpatient departments of clean, suddenly they were not available for a number of people. So uh, people were just not able to access uh, health facilities. Uh, we were still building on our health facilities, so we, we are not as well developed or as widely covered as Europe or US or some of the other developed countries. So we were already challenged and this one just dumped another set of challenges on us. And the main cause of concern is that uncertainty. Uh, one of the things about uh, the human condition is that if you're given a particular condition, if you're uh, given a particular set of circumstances, how good or how bad it is, we will adapt to that very quickly. But the problem in this situation was that it was extremely uncertain. We, we didn't know whether lockdown was going to be lifted. We didn't know how many numbers would have increased. We didn't know whether uh, it's going to become a more severe case. We hardly knew anything about the virus. I mean, and, and a lot of the knowledge is still just being built up. Uh, we don't know when the vaccine will come or if it comes, will it be effective? So everything leads to uncertainty and it's very difficult to make a decision or to be stable in a situation of uncertainty. One of the things that our organization did in West India was that we built overnight, almost overnight, this business immunity platform. And if you look at the slide, you'll see the five questions that we were asking all companies. Almost all of our team just stopped doing our regular jobs. And we started calling every single corporate within the country and asking them these questions. Is your business facing continuity issues? And obviously the answer was yes, but the kind of continuity issues was extremely different from one place to another. You had a small company making water bottles, uh, bottled water, not able to access the material for making bottles. Whereas you had the largest of companies, the oil and gas companies who had a chemical stored in tankers across the country, 500 tankers across the country. And if it was not brought into a safe shelter, there's a high chance that it would explode. So, uh, such such like issues do you have a medical supply solution a number of companies they decided that you know they can't produce their normal goods during this time so they decided to produce medical devices medical supplies during this uh, crisis so i'm sure in uh, you would know in coimbatore and uh, tamil nadu in general this has been one of the greatest suppliers of ppe and masks through the country um, a number of auto companies stepped up. They started uh, making ventilator parts. A number of 3D printing companies started printing parts for other medical devices. You had uh, um, smaller companies that make uh, uh, plastics and uh, other materials started making surgical masks. So all of these things started happening. You, then we started asking our startups and scientists and entrepreneurs, do you have innovative solutions to combat COVID-19? And very early on, one of the scientists across the country came up and said that he has developed a part, a 3D printed part that, uh, manufact that can double the capacity of a ventilator. So a ventilator usually can cater to only one patient. But if you put this part, you can take out two tubes from the ventilator 
and the airflow of the two tubes is completely isolated and you don't have to buy another ventilator but the ventilator capacity gets doubled and we kept on receiving such innovative solutions we had another company develop a isolated opd which could be trans transported anywhere in the country and it was in the back of a truck and you had uh, every facility that was uh, required to test for covid uh, with ppes with uh, washroom facilities all of the testing facilities all contained in that truck and the truck could just go anywhere and they made about 40 50 of them and deployed it across the country uh, all of you are aware that almost every single day there was an advisory, there was a notification. Uh, I don't know if you were following only the central government or only the state government, but we were tracking every single notification from every department, from every state. Over the last two months, we've got about 800 notifications from across the country. And to understand that, to uh, some of the states were not translating it in English, so to translate that for everybody and put it there, within hours was a mammoth challenge. And then of course, there were a number of companies that were still doing well. So they started also stepping up and said that we want to actually contribute to this fight and we want to donate uh, to the PM Cares Fund, to the various state funds, and a, a huge amount of resources and money got uh, uh, mobilized to basis this. So a couple of things that got uh, observed was that one, most companies had built very, very lean supply chains. Um, they would probably concentrate their entire manufacturing in one or two countries there. They would have maybe one or two suppliers. And this was the time when people were trying to uh, manage their balance sheets and, and make it more efficient, make it more light. And when COVID hit, all of these strategies went out of the window. I think one of the biggest examples is Apple. And if you go back to Apple in uh, announcements from Apple in February, one of the first things is said that they'll probably not be able to bring out Apple iPhone 12 in September. And uh, they had serious doubts about iPhone 9, uh, that is iPhone SE. Um, and they still are struggling to make the deadline for iPhone 12. Now, there is a reason for that September deadline, which is so critical for Apple, because if they don't make the September deadline, they miss the Christmas, they miss the Thanksgiving season, which is their biggest revenue earners for the entire year. Their entire revenue gets built up in those two, three months. And if they miss that window, this entire year for Apple is gone. It, they might as well not just release a phone because it might be more expensive doing that. Now, suddenly all of their facilities were based in China, in other countries across the world. Uh, and when China and those other regions went in lockdown, they had no other facilities to manufacture this phone. So one of the things that they figured out was resiliency is something that they need to build in. And it's not the company that's demanding it. The shareholders are not demanding it that if you're not resilient, they probably will just walk out with the money. The other thing that came through was technology was a core part of everything. And those companies that had not adopted technology before COVID had completely suffered. And uh, one of the things, I'll just give you an example, you know, so Zoom, the platform that we are using right now, can you imagine how much growth rate it had achieved in the last two years? And most of that growth rate had come in the last two months. Any, any guesses in the chat? It was actually 45 times. So 400%, 1000% is completely underestimated, 45 times. And they grew to so much that their market cap was more than the combined valuation, combined valuation of all of the American airlines put together. And the American airlines are the largest airlines in the world. You put together all of those American lenses, Delta, American, United in one side, and then you put Zoom on the other side and Zoom still comes up on top. So anybody who had put technology at the heart of the business would have come out on top. Any, take another example, banks. Banks that were highly dependent on branch visitors or uh, you know, physical business, uh, in-person business, 
completely suffer during this period and uh, those those banks that had actually given out loans to such businesses also suffered very badly but other banks who had uh, other businesses which were completely technology enabled and had also enabled their customers for technology had got record volumes because those customers had nowhere else to go and they were forced to do this business or online sitting at home over the computers with those particular banks so and this is going to be a key feature this is going to be one of the strengths that india is going to uh, derive from covid 19 because we are a tech giant and if we can supply the technology for every company across the world i think that's where our growth is going to come from and just going back to one of the points that came on the chat was health will be a priority and health will be a priority in many ways so health is not going to be just uh, you know washing your hands and wearing a mask and uh, staying at home it's also going to be eating well ensuring your immune systems are not compromised because if you if you have read and if you have followed the covid-19 crisis everyone who had bad immune systems were not healthy who had what we call as comorbidities uh, actually suffered the most so this is going to be a major driver of revenue major driver of business going forward people are now taking work from home much more seriously they're going to uh, taking work and life balance much more seriously mental health much more seriously and this is now becoming a priority not just for private sector but even in the government you see some of the internal memos that are coming that everyone has been advised to watch their teams and ensure that the health is paramount and it's no longer a, you know it's it's no longer a funny thing to ask and if if it's a, if it's an emergency if it's a critical situation and all support is given to every team member and the last thing that we understood during this crisis was that this problem is not solvable if just one entity or one agency does it it has to be through collaboration it has through uh, it has to be through empowerment of the different people involved in the process every single person has something to contribute and every single person has a certain skill that can be used and if you are able to give that particular problem or piece of that uh, uh, work to the right person and allocate it properly the work gets done very quickly very efficiently what we saw during the crisis was that the government didn't really spend a lot of uh, time in actually uh, pro in procuring or building ventilators they quickly assembled a group of companies and said you figure it out you solve the problem and you come back to us when you have the solution then you none of the governments uh, the central government did not uh, go into each and every state and advise the state that you need to do this x y z each state was given sufficient power sufficient funding and sufficient uh, ability to do what was required to control the crisis broad parameters were set broad uh, guidelines were given but at the end of the day once the mission is very clear and you are able to collaborate that that's what actually lead, led us to the solution or that that's what actually brought us here otherwise we would have been in a much much worse place so again a class exercise so uh, i'll just uh, go out of this uh, slide share and i'll ask the class to maybe uh, tell me what what do they see as the sectors uh, that are going to do well and sectors which are not going to do well so let me just go back and and if you can just quickly pop it in the chat and then i'll write it down and this becomes a document for all of you to sort of take forward so yeah healthcare pharma yeah. sectors yeah i can see that so i'm just going to put it here technology agriculture okay so agriculture and food i'm going to club it there e learning okay so technology and i'm going to say tech enabled services 
cleaning industry okay that's a good one cleaning and sanitation e-commerce this is a good one actually so post uh, sars a few years ago about uh, 14 15 years ago china went through another virus called sars and uh, uh, just after Once again, uh, uh, Vivek, you muted. I'm so sorry. Yeah. I don't know how that happened. So I was just saying that uh, somebody had mentioned e-commerce. So e-commerce is an interesting one because uh, a few years ago, about 15 years ago, China went through another viral pan pandemic called SARS. And uh, after SARS, just after SARS, you would see that Alibaba suddenly shot up and became the giant that it is today. Before SARS, nobody really cared about e-commerce. And I, it will, it, it's related to a point that I'll make later on. But essentially what we are trying to say is that COVID is going to change the way we do business. Existing businesses is not, are not, existing business models are not going to do very well. But if you, if you are going to adopt technology, if you're going to adopt innovation, that's where you see success. Proprietary manufacturing. Why? Okay. I'm just going to put that here with a question mark. Internet services. Okay, I've already said that. Textiles. Okay. Tourism will go down. Okay, that's my next slide. Anything else? What other sectors are going to go up? What about financials? Okay. What about um, okay, okay. Three D printed man. Okay, that's it's already there. Purchase of assets. Aviation industry. I'll probably come in the next slide. Okay. Okay, I'll stop here. I'll go to the next slide. Okay, tourism and hospitality, airlines, real estate, okay. Automobiles, okay. Insurance, insurance will go up or go down? Okay. Again, media and telecom will go up or go down? I think it will go up, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you'll see a lot more entrepreneurs coming up. You're right. What about going down? What else will go down? Entertainment industry will go down. Okay. So good one. Okay. Travel will go down. Shopping malls, yeah. So any any areas with where la large number of people, paper industry, that's a good one, okay. Luxury. Luxury, okay. Theaters, okay. Theaters is like in that. Event planners, okay. That's a very, very specific one, okay. Cosmetic items will go up or go down? I think it will remain the same. What do you say? Building and construction might have a huge, that's right. That's right. Public transportation, okay, that's a good one. Okay, I mean, so you get the idea. So where the demand is going to come from the old models of doing work where uh, investments will go down okay I'm not sure why that is true but okay environment will be better um, okay again so positive i'll just put it down as positive and i'll go back to my deck
So I'll, I'll leave this deck with you and then you can have a look at what, uh, you know, what are the industries and what are the sectors that will go up and go down. But I think you've got the idea, right? You know, so old models of business are not going to work. New models of business are the way forward. So what now? I think one of the main things that we've understood is that this is an, this is obviously a disaster. I mean, this, there is no doubt about that. The economy has not seen the scale of lockdown globally, even during World War II, I think there was the economy still running, you had industry still going up and, uh, you know, people still going about and creating a demand. But this was one of those uh, a few months where nothing absolutely worked. And we were just sitting at home waiting for it to get over. But this is also a unique opportunity for us, where we can actually do some things which are impossible. I'll just take an example of the government. If any of you followed the finance minister's speeches in the last few weeks uh, and the presentations that she made, the very detailed hour long presentations for a week that she did, the Atma Nirbhar Bharat presentations, all of them were actually suggestions that were not new. They were pretty old and they've been in the system for a long time. But there has been this lethargy, there has been this resistance in the system to make it happen. Now, it is in this situation when you can actually take some of, those, some of those decisions to push them through because you have no other option. You have to ensure that the economy goes back up. And if these are the only things that are available. These are the only tools that are available for you to use. Then you need to execute them. So one of the things that maybe you need to reevaluate in your life is what are the things that you can do now that weren't possible earlier? And... Again, I'll take an example from a few people in my team. A lot of people got admission in universities in the US, in, in Europe, and they were all scheduled to go uh, in this June, July, and they're still sitting here in Delhi. But uh, now they're actually rethinking, now if we can't do our MBA, they have two options. One, one is they can actually do the courses online, or two, now you have an excuse, now you have a, a justification that you can do something else, you can start your own business. And if you fail, nothing is going to come out of it. I mean, nothing is going to happen. But if you succeed, that's a huge chance that, uh, you know, you could uh, grow your career into something else. And, and this is becoming, uh, you know, the new way of thinking that a lot of uh, uh, students that are uh, looking to go abroad are, are actually looking at. The other things that we are seeing is that businesses are now re-looking at their market and actually capturing or trying to capture a much larger market than was possible earlier. So, uh, for example, the way we do our business is mostly during in, through in-person meetings. And physically, I can't be available in more than one location. So I had to plan my travel, I had to plan my meetings. And there was only a certain number of people that I could reach out to at any given point of time. But now, today I can be in, uh, in, in uh, Hong Kong in the morning and US in the evening. I could be talking to 100 people. I could be talking to a group of 10 very influential people, all sitting from my home. And all of those people are available to talk to me as well because they have nothing else to do. So right now, all of the businesses that are actually looking at a their business model in a different way. They're actually growing much, much faster. They're actually uh, realizing that there is a world of opportunity out there that they have not seen earlier, would have just not been possible earlier. So here is where I will stop now. These are, this is the end of my slides. And uh, uh, my own learning from this entire crisis is that it's the basic principles of hard work and uh, innovation and entrepreneurial spirit will always work, but it's time to rethink some of the basic concepts and one has to now change the way that one has lived their lives. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ram. And I'm, you know, available to take any questions. Uh, if there are any. Uh, now the, uh, it's the audience time. If you've got some questions, you can raise your virtual hand. We will call you and probably you can uh, ask your questions directly. Or you can put it up on the chat and uh, Vivek will respond to those uh, 
questions. Uh, to start with the question and answer session, I've got a question to you, Mr. Vivek. Uh, yeah. I think as far as uh, foreign direct investment is concerned, uh, Singapore has invested the most when it comes to India, Singapore and Mauritius, if I'm right. Post-COVID, which country do you think will uh, invest more when it comes to India? So, you know, actually Singapore and Mauritius have been topping our FDI charts because uh, they're usually gateway uh, regions. You know, they're, they're not really the originator of funds. A lot of companies use Singapore and Mauritius as a stopping ground. They establish a company there and then invest into India. Uh, but if you eliminate Singapore and Mauritius, the next few countries are more significant. Japan, US, Germany, France, Taiwan, Korea. I think these are the five geographies that are keenly looking at India. Uh, these are the five geographies that have large companies that have invested uh, mostly in, in Southeast Asia with a little bit of footprint in India. But during the COVID crisis, I think everybody has realized that you know they need to diversify the presence a little more. So they are, I think, the future FDI originators of the of the next few months. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions from the audience? So I just got a private question. As we all know, India has been regarded as one of the alternate avenue for investments, especially FDIs, for a long time now. But I'm looking at the larger picture, we realize that it hasn't quite materialized yet. So how far do you think this COVID-19 situation can turn the tables around here? I I don't agree with that. You know, so FDI has actually we've been doing record FDI for a long time. In fact, last year, uh, we did another record year of FDF of nearly 70 odd billion. Um, and the five years before that has been has doubled the amount of FDI that has come into the country uh, in its entire lifetime. So I, I don't think that's quite true. However, COVID-19 situation can actually be a little positive for us in terms of FDI because what we've been able to do Two, two things. One is during COVID-19, we've actually stood by our companies, we've helped them, and we've ensured that the disruption has been minimal. And that has been extremely positive for a lot of companies looking at the entire global picture. And they have actually taken a call to invest in India. The other thing is, like I said, we have taken some of those difficult decisions for reforms. So looking at that, I think companies are now going to really look at India more, more keenly, more positively. So I think, I don't think this year is going to be the year where a lot of FDI is going to flow in because businesses are still restructuring. But yeah, going ahead, I think it's going to have a massive positive effect. Oh. What will be the advice to stock market investors? Uh, okay. I, I don't know this one. I mean, I, it's, it's a, it's, it's a point toss to be very fair. Uh, it, one has to wait and watch, I guess. And, uh, the one advice that I've always taken with me is always remain invested in market and uh, go back to fundamentals in a crisis. So utilities and food and pharma probably are the ones that I have personally invested, but I'm not sure whether it will work for you or not. Vivek, our uh, common friend, uh, Sabu Padmadas from um, University of Southampton is here in the room. Uh, yes. Sabu, can you um, unmute yourself and probably ask the question you want to? Yeah, sure. Uh, Hi, Vivek. Hi, Professor. How are you? <laughs> Greetings from a very early sunny uh, Southampton. Uh, no, I think it was really fascinating and very engaging talk. I think you've always, I think you, you throw points which are really crucial. But I just want to really touch base and ask you a question. What are the, uh, you know, essential uh, prerequisites which you would recommend uh, for, a, for, you know, for, for encouraging investment in India post-COVID? Thank you. Prerequisites. I think uh, one of the prerequisites which we are really working on is really targeted, focused information, uh, focused for the people who need it. So earlier, I think we would uh, have the problem of plenty where all 29 states would actually talk to the same investor and pitch the same thing again and again. And the investor would get confused with 29 options on what needs to be done in India, and they would decide to go to some other country. So what we are doing now, because we have technology and we have time, uh, people are willing to spend time and understand what uh, is the proposition here. 
we are actually building very specific information packs for everybody who is looking at india and giving a very specific solution to everybody is looking at india i think that has solved half the problem that uh, used to exist earlier the other half of the problem that we have been working on is uh, uh, manufacturing in certain sectors has been a little uh, expensive and those are the sectors that we want to be encouraged in india so what we have done is we've again gone back to the companies taken very specific feedback on what that cost disability is and built packages around those cost disabilities and we have been extremely targeted extremely focused and we want to ensure that it's only the companies that commit investment that generate value that generate employment that come to india and we support only them and not companies who are looking to engage uh, not engage with the economic engine of india so prerequisite uh, from a company's perspective uh, if i might add i think like i said go back to basics and really reexamine the businesses they are in and uh, understand what are the business lines they are in so i know a global oil and gas major they are completely revisiting the fact uh, the their entire business lines of uh, downstream upstream and midstream and uh, there are it's very likely that they are probably going to shut down their entire business vertical in midstream uh going forward and they have taken a call because uh for the next few years midstream is probably going to be one of the hardest hit sectors but that's a fundamental decision uh, that they have had to take and all companies again another uh, company that tcs uh, if you look at tcs they have taken up a, a decision to um push almost 70% of their employees to work from home again revisiting these assumptions is i think a very big prerequisite before we actually are successful post covid i'd like to make another quick comment if sure. i may is that you know well if you look at for example coimbatore coimbatore has been coimbatore tirupur that region has been quite silent but a very powerful economic engine in india yeah. i mean you know, fabric capital of india with lots of uh, opportunities now given that there are some global you know uh, kind of shifts in 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 manufacturing sectors moving out from china probably you know india particularly this this part of the world has a you know has a phenomenal opportunity so i think what what else i think for instance what can invest india do to really facilitate those opportunities you know connecting um, local companies or the potential you know exploring potential manufacturing sectors to you know uh, to, for example countries that are moving away from uh, sorry the, the the manufacturing units that are in china currently operating in china they are probably trying to really seek elsewhere i mean and uh, so there are markets like indonesia vietnam and and those emerging markets but uh, india definitely there is a huge potential absolutely you know and uh, one of the things that uh, again companies are realizing uh, it's not just the cost of manufacturing that matters anymore it is the co- the final cost Uh, of of selling the cost of getting the good from raw material to finished product in the store and that entire cost is what people are tracking or companies are tracking right now mm-hmm. and in that aspect there is a there's an immense amount of value that india is adding in terms of local companies uh, what we are encouraging is uh, com- there is ready built infrastructure what uh, foreign companies are looking to do is set up in india set up the footprint in india with minimal uh, investment or minimal capital uh, expenditure so in that case creating these local joint ventures or local partnerships becomes very critical and and that's where we are actually making the the pitch and and a lot of companies are actually going ahead and doing that okay thank you make some questions are there on the uh, chat so if you think if we yeah. can take up it of course of course um so your take on agriculture how does digital platform support it i think agriculture remains one of those sectors where uh, it it severely requires uh, digitalization uh, what we've been trying to do is in the in the first place link all of the markets within the country on a single digital platform and uh, expedite the process of price discovery 
one of the key reasons that agriculture is suffering now is because the farm uh, the farmer is not able to get a good price for their final produce and it ends up being wasted away rotted away where uh, you know you can you can easily see there is a requirement and there is a, a need for that food elsewhere in the country and if only the demand was conveyed at the right time uh, this could have been uh, avoided so i think a very comprehensive platform which provides demand supply and other inputs to the farmer at the right time uh, on a national scale uh, is the need of the hour i think that is what uh, will really change agriculture uh, i think a lot of corporates are coming here and asking us to make fundamental changes to our sector by asking us to corporate uh, corporatize the farm sector uh, aggregate land i don't personally think that's the way to go i think uh, for india the cooperative model has been fairly successful and if you again draw broad guidelines and develop a platform and a system for farmers to contribute to a cooperative kind of structure uh, it might be much more successful than in uh, than a corporate farm kind of a uh, setup and that's where technology is key if you don't have technology you can't manage 50000 100000 200000 farmers in one go a very long commentary here when mm -hmm. you look at <laughs> I'll, I'll probably respond to this later on because it's going yeah, to sure. take me a minute to at least uh, uh, read that uh, so there's one on the majority of workers are from bihar and they're leaving now to their own place so what will be the result of business in the future uh, it's a very good question you know so uh, if you go back a good uh, i think 7 uh, 8 years ago or maybe I, i don't really remember exactly when but a few years ago when the manrega scheme was uh, announced uh, and uh, <clears throat> i'll just give a quick background on the manrega scheme so the manrega scheme guarantees 180 days of employment to every laborer uh, every uh, worker or every laborer who's out of work after doing their harvest or after doing their agricultural work at the point of their residence so in in their villages or in their districts or in their towns where they are and this this work is usually civil construction work or road building or uh, stuff like that so what happened was earlier the earlier model before manrega was that uh, laborers and workers would be, would spend 6 months in the village doing agricultural work and the remaining 6 months when there is no work in the farm or on the field they would go to cities and help in construction sites or be part of industry uh, be there on the work uh, workshop uh, floor and suddenly after manrega you see that almost 30% of these laborers didn't come back uh, to the cities uh, to the construction sector and that particular year the real estate sector really suffered because the, the cost of uh, uh, actually hiring a labor or finding a laborer became that much higher uh, but eventually the market stabilized i think eventually they hired uh, the the sufficient amount of laborers the cost of hiring obviously increased but market will find its own balance and again in this situation like i said uh, the companies will have to find a balance there is a, uh, a potential for renegotiation there is a potential for ensuring that uh, workers are taken care of and this is also a function of the nature of kind of employment contracts these workers are in most of these workers are in temporary contracts now if they were in permanent contracts they would have felt a little more safer and uh, more wedded to the company they're working in so maybe companies will start offering more permanent jobs and that will lead to a better lifestyle for the worker as well so uh, i think this could fundamentally change some of the uh, dynamics over there will uh, covid-19 issues affect ceramic industry in export of raw materials I, I would imagine so. I mean, if it's linked to uh, real estate, I think the demand for real estate will come down, um, and and uh, definitely there will be uh, a demand hit over there as well. Uh, one last question. Well, when it comes to investment climate in India, it has improved uh, considerably since nineteen ninety one. India yeah. today is part of uh, top hundred club. when it comes to ease of doing business 
Now, you have two routes when it comes to investing in India. One is automatic route, the other one is a government route. What yeah. exactly does automatic route mean? So automatic route means, uh, I'll, I'll just uh, explain it in a very simplistic way. When you invest in the country, what you need to do is you need to open a bank account with one of the Indian banks. Okay. And you have to transfer money uh, uh, for, for purchasing equity shares in an Indian company into that Indian bank account. And at the point of that Indian bank account, the, the banker will ask you, what is this money for? And you say that it's for equity shares. And then after that, you say which sector it is in. Now, if that sector is within the list of automatic root uh, sectors, then the banker basically allows you to transfer the money forward and you can use it for whatever you need. But if it is under government approval method, if we will ask you for another piece of paper, which is basically the approval from the government saying that you can use this money to buy shares in that particular sector. So this is the main key difference. And the reason for that is there are certain sectors which are restricted. Uh, some of the sectors are like tobacco, lottery, real estate, where uh, we are trying to control a number of investors. Uh, and, and uh, you know, we don't want those investments to really come into the country unless it's really critical. The other sectors uh, like retail and pharma, again, are critical to the economy. And we don't want mal uh, malpractice, uh, sorry, uh, bad players in the system um, and, and come in and actually create havoc in some of these critical sectors. So that's where as part of this approval process, the government vets the investor and uh, allows that investor to go ahead. And uh, from what I can understand, this is fairly standard practice across most countries, especially in their critical sectors. Uh, that was an excellent talk. In fact, it was um, very insightful and all of us gained a lot of information from your presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.